started. If uh, folks miss uh, part of the introduction, this will be available uh, as a recording later, so we can, we're can we happy to share. Uh, but again, thank you everyone for joining and welcome to Quilt's inaugural tech talk on building a data lake for biotech. Uh, my name is Ash Al Hashim. I'm on the commercial team here at Quilt. We have two fantastic speakers today who I'm delighted to introduce. Eric Goldbrenner is a technical consultant who works with drug companies to create regulatory compliance software and data infrastructures. He has deep experience articulating functional requirements and designing information technology architecture. Among his accomplishments are leading the Big Data Initiative for the University of California Office of the President, uh, delivering a HIPAA compliant data management system hosted at the San Diego Supercomputer Center. Eric is PMI, a PMI member. He, he's a certified Agile Scrum Master, and he holds a degree in Applied Mathematics from San Francisco State University. Uh, and Nish Karv is a polymath who specializes in data and visualization, machine learning, 3D graphics, and designing experiences. He's the co-founder and CTO of Quilt Data, a self-organizing data lake. He spends his day helping teams in biotech pick architectures that get them the most from their data, Anish holds an MS in computer science from the University of Wisconsin, uh, go Big Ten, and a BS in computer science from the University of South Florida. Without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Anish for a short overview of today's talk. Uh, Anish, go ahead. Great. All right. So at a very, very high level, Eric is going to walk you through the first part of the talk, which is really motivating strategically what are some of the challenges you're going to encounter on the road to drug discovery. And you'll be able to feel firsthand, and I'm sure you'll see a lot of yourself in the scenarios that Eric sets up. And then in the latter, the second half, I'm going to get very tactical and give you very specific pointers on things you can do today to help get your data lake in a format that's more usable by all the stakeholders. And that really has this nice self-organizing property, which we're going to shoot for. And at a very high level, even if you're listening and you're outside of the biotech domain, I think you're going to find that this, these tips and tricks or the survival guide that we give you really works uh, across verticals. That's going to be energy, machine learning, transportation, biotech. The principles really are, are the same across all those verticals. And I'm going to hand it over to Eric now. And Eric would, would love if you can kind of sort of motivate the big picture for us. All right. Thanks, Anish. So I want to tell you a little story about drug discovery. You're probably familiar with it. It starts out with Doc. Doc does his academic research. He reads the journals, and he comes up with an idea. His idea is if he could hit a biologic target, then he could control how cells behave or perhaps neutralize cells and do something that's beneficial. So he thinks about what target he might want to hit. Let's say it's a particular protein on the surface of a cancer cell. Does a little proof of concept and presents his ideas to financiers, venture capitalists. And maybe there are some sort of uh, internal review board at his company. And they fund the project. So he takes the financing and he purchases the equipment that he needs to set up a lab. Researcher comes on board. They outsource some of the work to a contract lab. He has collaborators. And pretty soon there's chaos. Problem is there's no data architecture. They all need to share access to the same data but there's no uh, particular process in place to make it happen. There's no SOP for collaboration. Their workflow is too complicated. They are putting a lot of money into applications and storage, but they're not using those consistently throughout the enterprise. And so data is being saved to multiple locations. There's no authoritative reference copy. The scientists are emailing their data files back and forth. Meanwhile, there's no genealogy tracking or version control on it. The access controls that they have in place are hindering people from actually getting to the data when they need it. But at the same time, it's not really providing real robust security. Bottom line is researchers can't find their important data. So Doc asks IT for help. And IT says, here's what you need to do. You need to put all this data in the cloud. 
we're going to build you a data lake in the cloud. You're going to throw all your raw data and files into a bucket. You're going to assign each document a URL, and we're going to tag each document with metadata. We're going to know its source, its format, timestamps, versions, who owns it, and most importantly, the content. We'll attach access control lists to the owner's identity, so we'll have security in place. And when it comes to the content, we'll automatically read these files and generate a content catalog for you that you can search. You search by keyword. It doesn't matter if you know the actual keyword. It'll be smart enough to understand synonyms because we're going to derive this metadata automatically from your content. And then we'll have a definitive reference source of all your data and we'll connect all of your third-party applications to it. It's going to look kind of like this. The applications talk to the API, the data is in the cloud, everything goes in the bucket. There's a hyperlink uh, URL for each piece of data. We've metadata tagged it, have access control lists. You have a catalog, you've got search. We'll give you a browsable interface um, so other computers can attach to it. And then all you have to do, Doc, is go into your catalog and look up your data. And you can do it by any common, common dimension that you're, you're looking for. You can look by assay type or cell line or chemical compound. You can search through the files by file type. You can look for gene sequences. You can search by lab instrument. Choose your organism. Look for protein structures, tissues, what, whatever, right? So Doc thinks about this and he says, are you out of your mind? I don't have time for that. I've got a report to get out. We're doing research here, not building the pie in the sky data infrastructure. If you really want to help me, you'll help me get all this data together so I can publish my report. So here's the first thing you have to understand this is true. The data process of drug discovery is necessarily complex and it is expensive. And the system exists primarily to produce the documents that you need for regulatory approval. The system is not designed to enable reuse of data. I'm sorry. So IT helps the team, they pull all the data together, they pump out a report, the report goes to the gatekeepers and the company. And Doc has proven that he's been able to hit his target. They actually have a lead to become a drug candidate. And so they fund, fund the next round of research. We move to early development. Now all the problems that we had before continue to exist. And we're bringing on pharmacology to formulate the drug bringing on CMC to scale up the process. Uh, we're starting to do live organism testing, you know, testing uh, in vivo. PKDM gets a hold of the data and they install these massive computing grids where they can do all sorts of, you know, non-compartmental analysis. They run non-MEM and win non lend They're doing all these different combinations. They need data scientists programming help to support them with, with processing all that data. Labs are springing up everywhere. And the problems that we had during the hit to lead phase while doing research in the lab continue to exist, only they're larger scale. Now you've got data siloed by function. Every function's got their own database, their own limbs, their own applications, their own file servers. They try to share data, but the governance process is completely Byzantine, by which I mean the rules that apply to CMC are different than the rules that apply to PKDM. Um, there's no consistent data standards here. Meanwhile, there's growing demand for access to the working data by all functional areas. Everyone needs to share data and it takes way too long to get it from point A to point B. The system's grown so big and unwieldy, it's impossible to fix it. Now the, the company is spending lots of money just to work around the deficiencies in the data process yet we pro proceed, pump all that data into a report. This is a report for regulatory approval. Goes to the regulators, they approve it. The gatekeepers fund the next phase and we go to clinical trials. I'm getting to the end of my story. I wanna tell you what's going, well, first let me tell you what happened, <laughs> okay? We've just invested millions of dollars in application storage and data processing, and none of that 
has really helped us appreciate the value of our data. And what's going to happen is functional areas are going to want to use the, the existing data for infrastructure, things like our ELNs and our LIM systems, manufacturing systems, but they can't get licenses, they don't have permission, connectivity is not there, so IT is going to start you know, running point solutions back and forth between departments. Scientists are going to want to analyze animal data from all drug programs. They're going to say, show me all the data that's related. Uh, show me all the data where we use a certain buffer in a formulation, and we're not going to be able to produce that data to respond to their request. Meanwhile, management's going to acquire some related drug program from another company, and they're going to want to merge our development systems and operations with this new company. We can't even make our own process work. An investor is going to want to finance clinical trials in exchange for a stake in the drug. He's going to say, show us all the data for your existing program. Well, you saw what effort it takes just to pull together that data for our regulatory submissions. We can't just pull it all together, you know, in a snap like that. Scientific team, they're going to get called on to defend some uh, research that was published in a journal, and we're going to need to reproduce the data. And regulators are going to request all sorts of detailed information. Will we be in position to produce it for them? So I'm going to conclude with a couple of recommendations. What you ought to do is create a data lake in the cloud at the very beginning and make that data lake the central repository for all of your reference data for all your applications. And then define a workflow process where all the users are reading their source data from that data lake. And any of the analysts who are publishing uh, data, they're, they're reading source data and publishing analytics, they need to put their results back into the data lake. The data lake has to generate its own human readable content catalog. It has to actually read the content, create a metadata repository, and give end users some kind of browse and search capabilities. And the last thing is you want to make sure that you've got controls and security embedded in this system because someday uh, we're going to want to apply this to regulatory compliance situations. So that concludes my presentation. And with that, I turn it back to you, Anish. Eric, thanks a lot for that motivation. Um, it was super compelling to me. Uh, among the listeners, I'm really curious if people have kind of felt some of the pain points or experienced some of the pain points that, that Eric has mentioned. Go ahead and chime in the comments if you see or recognize yourself in that image. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about now, I'm gonna go ahead and fire up my screen share, but the, the thought I was really present to while Eric was speaking was that it's much easier to prevent a forest fire than it is to contain a forest fire after it's broken out. And that's really what this proactive data strategy is that I'm gonna be recommending to you in just a moment here. And let me start my screen share. I'm gonna go ahead and share my keynote with you. And here we're gonna really delve into the, the tactical points that you can use as a team to start to help containing this forest fire ahead of time and, and really create the data lake up front. So is everybody able to, to see my screen uh, okay? Great, I, I can't multitask super well because I actually have to only see the presentation while it's up. All right, so, so the first thing I wanna cover is, is what are the technical barriers that really stand in the way of, of a single source of truth? And, they are, and I'm getting a little feedback, guys. I don't know if everybody else should mute. Great, so... There are a couple things that are challenging here. Uh, one is, let me go back to full screen here for a second. One is that we, we don't really know what the schemas are at the time that we write the data, and that's gonna become material. The second thing is that the schemas tend to change and evolve over time. And this is a big one now. By the time we get deep into the clinical part of the process, uh, the queries that we're gonna need to run have been discovered long after data collection has taken place and long after we've lost context for what the data even means. And you know, this really brings me to, to my first main point that 
box is not data management. So folder structures and files names, they don't scale well. File names keep getting longer and longer. The folder structures keep getting deeper and deeper. And there's no single canonical structure that covers all the ways that users might want to query the data after the fact. Uh, the other issue that we have, uh, I call these write-only databases. So uh, we've got ELNs, we've got LIM systems, we've got box. And you can put data into these systems, but getting data out, especially programmatically, is extraordinarily difficult. The documentation is, is always a struggle with the data. Uh, data in the absence of documentation quickly becomes meaningless. And, and there really isn't a single system that, that everyone can use. And so I, I want to start to skate you towards a solution and really outline 10 major points that constitute what I call a self-organizing data lake. And this is really the, the big thing that, that we at Quote would like to contribute to the world is, can we move to a world where the schemas are discovered, not defined up front, and gradually refined over time? And what kinds of quality gates can we put in place so that you can move from, hey, I've got the super swampy raw data that I've received from a CRO, or super swampy raw data from the sales team, from the bench science team, just Excel files dumped in box, to highly curated and trusted data sets that you can make business decisions off of. What can we do to embed the documentation in the data and, and really take advantage of something that has become indispensable in the world of code, and that is pure functions and immutable data. And so this is the last diagram I'm going to show before I go into the, the real nuts and bolts of how this works. This is from Martin Consato's Lake House Unified Data Infrastructure article. And what I want to draw your attention to there is the storage column in the middle there. And there are other tools which you'll be familiar with. The data on the data warehouse side, you've got BigQuery, you've got Snowflake. On the data lake side, you've got Databricks, you've got Delta Lake. Uh, but below that, what's really missing from the industry is a principled process that lets you control your data in discrete life cycles as you move from swampy collections in box to things that are ready for Snowflake and ready for the rest of the data warehouse. And so our job at Quote really is not to replace any existing technologies, but to provide these missing pieces in the data lake functionality so you have something that everybody can use. And that's so that there's a well-defined data life cycle and quality life cycle around data as it progresses through the organization. Uh, so I'm going to go through these 10 principles. I won't read them to you. I'm just going to jump right in. And they might seem a little contradictory, but it'll all make sense, I promise, in the end. So, so first of all, you won't know the optimal schema for, let's say, an experiment. So if you're working with flow cytometry data or CRISPR data or respiratory data, you very oftentimes, or machine learning data sets, maybe in text classification, you don't know the schema for the data set at the outset. And data sets are highly multimodal, which means you're going to have unstructured data, structured data, semi-structured data all mixed together. And in the early phases, when you're just figuring out what you want, you don't want there to be a schema so that your team can go faster. Uh, now, this is really the kind of the important insight is that even when there's no schema, there's a schema. And so I'm starting out with don't have a schema in the beginning, but I'm saying always have a schema. And this is really where the concept of metadata schema comes in. And we've contributed a lot of the work I'm going to explain to you in the open source. So this is free and open for everyone to use today. But the key point is that this concept of a manifest or a list of items that's in the data set allows you to have a schema even when the data themselves don't have any schema at all. And I'm going to show you how that works. So at a very, very high level, I want you to start thinking about data sets as proper sets. And these are sets. They have elements in them. And at a very, very high level, what we've done in the open source is we've taken, so a logical key is just how your user thinks of the data, readme.md, data.parquet. The physical key is where the data lives in the data lake. In this case, the base layer of the data lake is S3. And then you've got metadata. Hey, what is the SHA-256 hash of this file? Uh, who is the user that contributed this file? And before you know it, once you start thinking about your data in terms of data sets, you've actually defined a schema. But that schema is so flexible that you can put any type of data into it. And this is going to become important later when we show you how you can actually SQL query your data. So the big thing that I want you to take away here is that when you start thinking of your data sets and your processes as proper sets that are defined in a manifest and have a programmatic construct that defines, hey, these are all the things that we need to make a given business decision or a given clinical decision, you're halfway towards defining the schema. Or in some sense, you have a meta schema that can work for almost for any collection, an arbitrary collection of data. This is, again, the kind of the, the, the real, to give you an intuition for how this works, what we've done in the open source 
is created a something like a data container that we call a package, and you can literally put anything you want. You can you put images into it, you can put Excel files into it, prism files, it doesn't matter what you put into it, but this package is a uniformizing construct which allows you to just take boxes, throw them in the attic, throw them in the attic, throw them in the attic, and when you're done, you get this nice self-organizing property, and I, and I wanna show you how that works. Uh, so the first and, and most important recommendation that I can make for people who are out there designing and thinking about what they want their data lakes to look like is you wanna build around blob storage at the core. And as Hadoop has fallen apart, uh, it really has fallen apart, this was kind of the, the zeroth generation of data lakes, everybody realized we really need to separate compute and storage. And this is what blob storage does for you. It really is at this optimal point in the cost performance trade-off. You can literally put, that's why it's called blob storage, you can put any type of data into it. Um, you can bring the compute to the data, this is critical. Uh, data really becomes center of mass, and you want to be able to, from a data center perspective, leave the data where it is at rest, and then run compute in a rack that's in the same data center, so you're not paying for I.O., and so you get fast performance with your data. So data is becoming now the center of gravity, and we move compute to the data rather than the other way around, for the most part. I do want to encourage teams to avoid, in the beginning, databases and network-attached storage. Um, they don't have well-defined lifecycle policies. Again, you won't know the schema up front. So blob storage is, is really the sweet spot in terms of flexibility and cost where you want to focus. Uh, the next thing is you want to start thinking about you're going to have this long set of processes that lead to a clinical drug discovery or a target discovery. I want you to think about defining a data lifecycle. And what we've taught a lot of our customers in the biotech domain, and this applies perfectly to machine learning as well, is that you've kind of got, you can break down data lifecycle into three buckets. And at the very initial bucket, you have this super swampy data. I'm not sure what it is. There's no schemas, there's no documentation. And as we move that data set up to production across multiple buckets, we start to harden the schemas. And the key point here really is that I want you to think about dividing your data lake into a raw data, staging data where users are iterating with that data, and then a production bucket or a production domain where you can really base decisions on and link to ELNs and other systems of record. And the key point here is that we control the chaos. As we move in, in the world of code, to think about what branches allow you to do. Well, buckets are effectively functional equivalents of branches in the data world, and I want you to think about dividing your data lake into buckets that control the level of swampiness or the level of chaos uh, for the data. Now, the next thing is, what does it mean to control swampiness as we go from bucket to bucket? Well, what it really means is that we are putting checks in place to ensure that the data has enough of a schema to where it meets our basic expectations. Uh, at a very high level, for unstructured data, that's probably the trickiest to define data life cycles for, but you can use, for instance, for images, you can use PIL to check the dimensions of an image. For text corpses, you can define custom rules in Python. The important thing is that even unstructured data has certain basic sanity expectations around it. Images should not be empty. Corpus files in a text corpus should not be empty. For semi-structured data, we use uh, JSON schemas, um, and that really allows us to define, hey, these are all the fields you must define. This is the bare minimum of metadata that we need in this file or in this experiment in order for it to be usable. And for structured data, we're really liking a system that's called grid expectations. Uh, I will make sure that all the attendees have a copy of this deck, so obviously you don't need to memorize it. These are all hyperlinked. And uh, I, it's probably a little difficult to read, but in the lower left there, I'm showing you a JSON schema. And what that means is that as you move from the swampy initial raw data area to the staging area, you can start to impose schemas on the elements in, in your data lake. And that includes these schemas, again, go all the way, I'm calling them schemas, but they encompass both unstructured, semi-structured, and structured data. All right, let's talk about databases for a second. So in the example that Eric gave, you can, by the time you get to the end of the process and you're generating these deep reports, boy, there are a lot of SQL queries people would like to be able to run. But the question is, how do you develop a SQL accessible data lake or data warehouse without knowing upfront what the schemas are? And the answer is, uh, we're big fans of PrestoDB here at Quilt. Uh, this exists in the Amazon ecosystem. First of all, it's an open source project developed by Facebook. It exists in the Amazon ecosystem as Athena, as a hosted version of Presto, auto-scaling as well. Uh, and the key thing is that it's tolerant of missing values. Column names can change. You can drop columns. You can have an entire folder with files that have all different schemas. And the important thing is that unlike a system like Hadoop, you don't pay for compute. You don't pay for queries when you're not using them. 
And the key thing that you can do here, and if there's time at the end, I can go into it and actually show you how this works, is you can go into your data lake and say, hey, give me all the files that came from a, that were produced by a particular algorithm version that have to do with a specific gene target, and it all reads directly from S3. Um, there are some weaknesses of schema on read databases. They're generally not strong for transactional needs, but overwhelmingly for analytics, they're the right choice. And in the target discovery domain, really, the, it's, it's analytics that we need for, for report generation. Embedding documentation with data. There's a little teaser there on the right-hand side. Remember, data without documentation quickly becomes meaningless. And uh, I'm just going to diverge for just a second. Actually, I'll, I'll pause that for a second. But if you look on the right-hand side, the real data asset is not only the raw data itself, but the team's understanding of that data. That's Jupyter Notebooks. That's uh, Vega visualizations. And I really want you all to think about, in this data set concept, not just including the raw data, but including the interpretation of the data, how people access the data in code, and how people think about that data through, through visualization. Indexing metadata for discovery. Again, when we get to the demo part, I'll actually show you how this works. But Elasticsearch is excellent for this. Um, one thing you may notice right away, we've talked, I've talked a lot about the separation of compute and storage. But the key thing is that Elasticsearch actually kind of violates this rule, because you do scale compute and storage one to one. So the key thing you need to do to control search, so first of all, think of Elasticsearch as a microscopic copy and index to the primary data that's in S3. It fits that model very, very well. But the reason you're, the dials you have to control costs are twofold. So one is only index, only deep index certain data and file types in Elasticsearch. Um, use Ultraworm for, in, which is kind of a, an S3 storage base, a low cost storage index form for Elasticsearch for indexes that aren't hotly accessed. And, and we can talk more about this when we get to the Q&A part. All right, uh, the, the, big, the big reveal here. Uh, one of the things that people realize too late, uh, because to Eric's point, people don't realize that data should be thought of as a reusable asset, is that, hey, I would really like this ability to time travel and reconstruct what did I have at point X in time or point Y in time. And this concept of immutability, if you followed this the literature on functional data engineering really says that every step, every evolution of the data set needs to exist as an immutable snapshot in time. And what this reproducibility buys you is not just a buzzword. It means that you're audit ready. So you can always roll back and be like, hey, what state was the model in on January 5th? It means that teamwork, that a collaborative team can build on the work of other team members. So many of our quote customers have multiple offices around the world. How do you know that Switzerland, California, and Japan are all doing the same thing? Well, reproducibility is the bedrock there. And when the person in Japan can rehydrate or reconstruct the same model and the same training set that the teams in Switzerland and the United States have, that's what allows your, your team to, to move more quickly. So reproducibility is not about a buzzword. It's about producing more correct results with smaller teams. On the blob storage layer, I highly encourage teams to enable object versioning, which gives you some deletion protection, number one, and really lets you start to develop the history of each object as it mutates in the data lake. And what we've provided in the open source with Quilt is really a system of taking individual versioned objects and collecting them into, into a data set. And all those file formats are open. All that software is open and free for you to use. I've got a little link to an article that I've written here. And the pink formula at the bottom is, this is how you really want to think of every stage in the evolution of your data lake. And that's that every checkpoint has an immutable hash from Git, that's where your code from, comes from, uh, an immutable hash from Docker, that's where your environment comes from, and then an immutable hash of data. That's the, where Quilt really comes and, and brings this concept of the data lake as having these immutable snapshots. And so if every point in time, if every evolution in your process of drug discovery is a pure function of these three variables, you can now travel time and reproduce experiments as well at will. Your, all your data is automatically auditable and your team will move faster as a whole. Uh, last comment I wanna make is about, in terms of tips, is building role-based access. Uh, so this not only lays the foundation for auditing, but if you have HIPAA requirements, PCI, you have high trust requirements, you really need a couple of pieces. So uh, the first is you want your data oftentimes to be resident to a particular area. For instance, we work with companies in China and we make sure that to comply with 
the Chinese government regulations, that data needs to remain in Beijing or within data center. So you're going to you first want to break out your projects into self-contained regional buckets, right? And this is part of this grid system of buckets that form your data lake. Use IM roles as opposed to resource-based policies to enforce access. Um, I talked earlier about bringing the compute to the data, so um, not the other way around. And what this allows you to do is to retain your compliance around data remaining in your cloud and in the regions where that data uh, is, is designed to reside. Um, I mentioned avoiding bucket policies. Bucket policies tend to become much more difficult to reason about who has access, and it's too easy to write bugs. And the real reason to avoid bucket policies is that you should be turning on CloudTrail for to audit every access to your buckets. So CloudTrail will essentially um, create a log of uh, every read, every write, every mutation. And of course, you want that in a separate account, both for security reasons and to prevent recursive CloudTrail logging. Let's, uh, the, what I want to conclude with is once you are able to put together something like a self-organizing data lake strategy, it, it should have a, important properties for you. So, so one is it should give your team a substantial head start on their data lake and data management initiatives instead of being behind. You know, and this is really think about that forest fire analogy. Once the fire is broken out, it becomes very difficult to contain. But if you have this grid of buckets and a data management lifecycle in place, Ahead of time, uh, you have a very likely chance of, of getting a head start on your initiatives. And really what you want to see is your team members, your critical team members, data architects, data engineers, getting back a full day, a week of their time uh, because the other users of the data lake can self-serve. And you really want to see this waste in the form of repeated experiments go down. So if you just have an elastic search pile where you can go like, have we ever run an experiment on X? You already are one step towards saving the cost of, of a wasted experiment. I've got a bunch of links and resources in here for you as well. And I'd love to pause there and uh, open up the floor for q and I know I went over a lot very quickly, but my goal was, was really to give you a sense of what's possible. I'm going to pause the share for just a moment and uh, see what questions the, the folks might have. Thank you, Anish. Uh, Great, great talk, uh, both of you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we already have a few uh, kind of a, a little bit of discussion going off in the going off in the side panel here. Um, conversations around frictionless data versus great expectations. Um, yep. uh, any thoughts uh, there, Anish? Uh, yeah, I think those are very different systems. Um, first of all, I think for in the context of this talk, when you are worried about profiling structured data that great expectations is going to do a lot more for you. So the great expectations as a system is really designed to implicitly profile your data for you. And I'm going to give you a prime example. I have an Excel file. I don't know what's in it, but I throw it at great expectation. It says, well, there should be 10 columns. This column should be a number. This column should be a string. And this column should have 40 values. And uh, whereas frictionless requires you more to declare your own schema so the data is accessible to others, um, and I, I think where the industry is skating is, is where Great Expectations really does different things for you and more for you. And uh, I, want, I, my, I encourage people to look at that as a proactive way to automatically start profiling your data and knowing how it should look. I see the Lion King reference uh, from Gwen there on, on the circle of life and data. Uh, and that's very, it's true in that we don't, data just happens and we don't realize that there's going to be a whole set of needs on it. Uh, we might need to erase some of the data. We might need to reproduce some of the data. And that's really what the value of proactively thinking about data life cycles is. Good tables, by the way, I'm just seeing uh, Kevin's. Uh, yeah, good tables is closer to great expectations, although I don't have as much experience with it. Any down and dirty questions we can answer about S3 or compute? I'd love to hear from the audience. What are people running analysis in today? So do people get asked to make PowerPoint decks? Um, do you have to hand edit an Excel file? How are you generating analyses today? Uh, I see R markdown. Um, 
and web apps. Okay, great. Let's let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so those are both uh, perfectly acceptable uh, forms. And I think the key thing there, I'm just going to pop up a screen share here for a second. I think the key thing there is making treating our markdown as an asset. So there's one problem. Oh, Prism and GraphPad, right? Uh, there's one problem I'd love to solve for the industry, and I hope that data scientists and bench scientists never get asked to make a PowerPoint deck again. And uh, I want to show you a kind of a, a very simple, lightweight dashboard that you can build for yourselves. And there are many interpretations of this. We've seen it across numerous companies. Um, all right, so hopefully you can see my screen here. And uh, just give me one second. Is this I got? Sorry, folks, I have a look. Okay, here we go. All right, great. Um, so the point I'm trying to go to here is that instead of thinking of a report as a dead consumable, I, I want us to start thinking about reports as living artifacts. And, and here's what I mean. So as an example of what we do uh, in the quilt system, the documentation and the data live side by side. So uh, yeah. this could be PDFs, uh, it could be Jupyter notebooks, it could be our markdown files. And once you start to add these to the data collection and you have a system where non-technical users just come in, even if I don't know anything about Jupyter, I can be like, oh yeah, okay, here's what's happening. This is the geometry collection. Um, this is actually zip code data that we're looking at, and here's the data for Alabama. This, we think, should replace PowerPoint slides. And I, I'd love, if that's, cow if that's a controversial, I'd love to hear that. Um, our vision really is that users can generate dashboards one time using primarily Jupyter Notebooks right now. I, I think we'll, we'll have an expanded R story in the near future. But generate dashboards one time and then version those dashboards as the data mutates. And instead of a PowerPoint presentation, you should share this with the organization and be like, all right, here it is. Here's the data. So self-serve, dig in. And then any questions that people have, um, they can kind of, they can look at the data, they can look at the dashboards. Um, there'll always be this gap where you, you know, need to run proper SQL, but uh, I think that's, that's our vision for getting rid of PowerPoint and sharing live data dashboards. Um, I see web apps from Diego. Diego, are, Diego, are those uh, hand rolled web apps that that you're writing, or is there like a toolkit that that you're using? Oh, got it. Cool. So it looks like Dash is kind of specialized for that. Uh, there is one thing I'd love to show the team, show the folks, because we talked a little bit about SQL querying. Oh, right, Dash and React. Yep. And I guess, like I said, custom dashboards are going to exist forever. Um, I think the real question is how much platform can abstract that away so that it leaves just a little bit of custom dashboard for, for you to really write. Raw React, React is great. All of Quilt, all the Quilt web catalog is built on top of React. It's just uh, you need a PhD increasingly to program React. So it's all about, hey, where can we shave time and, and give you some components off the shelf that you can use. On the SQL querying side of things, uh, one of the things that Eric mentioned is that, hey, this, this hairball of data kind of develops over time. And the property we're really aiming for in a self-organizing data lake is you can pull on a single hair, sorry, I know this metaphor is very strained, and that then becomes the, the canonical dimension that, that you organize the data around. And I wanna show you a little bit of, of how Quilt integrates with ad hoc querying systems like Athena because that is really what makes the data lake usable to all the technical users and really makes it scale. And I'm just gonna fire this up here. I'm gonna share my Firefox in just a moment here. Okay, um, and I wanna start from the business asset down. And so uh, this is one of our partners, both in the public cloud and they're a, a private quote customer as well. But the Allen Institute for Cell Science, again, doesn't matter if you're doing cells. It doesn't matter if you're doing quantum mechanics. It doesn't matter what kind of data. But but the business asset is really this this data set, right? And when Alan Cell was developing these packages, they had no thought of SQL, no thought of querying. They're just all right. Take a box, put it in the attic. Take a box, put it in the attic. And that box became uh, an element of reproducibility, right? So you can take this box, this package, and pull it down, pull it into a notebook, and use it. Uh, but but the other the other big thing that happened is they started to journal metadata alongside their data, and I'm going to show you how that makes everything SQL accessible in Athena. 
So there's a high level metadata, which is the metadata for the experiment or the package, right? So just simple commit message, hey, I'm updating the feature explorer links and documentation for a new bucket. Where things get really cool is, so that's the metadata on the bundle, so to speak. But where things get really cool is on an individual asset. So this is an unstructured asset. It's a TIFF. It's a slice of cell images. But where they really went crazy and where this really makes systems like Athena powerful is they just chucked a bunch of metadata on there. And they said, hey, this is the algorithm that produced this particular piece of data. This is the algorithm version. This is the plate ID. This is the associated gene. And they just built up a metadata pile. And, and here's where it becomes really, really neat. By virtue of the fact that this metadata is in this data set or manifest or package format, it's automatically loaded into Athena and you don't have to do anything at all. And so uh, there's a, a very, very simple table that, again, it's a single command to generate. And this table allows you to look out across all of the packages you've generated in the data warehouse. And I want to show you here, I want to dissect, I'm going to blow up. Is everyone, able, is everyone seeing SQL right now? Um, I want to I dissect the SQL query for a second because I think it's emblematic of, hey, I want to unpack this hairball that we've created as a company and pull out a dimension to, to be my hero dimension for the analysis. And so what I'm doing here is I'm saying, hey, give me all of the TIFF files, right? I'm looking for images. And that were produced by algorithm version 1.3.star and that contain a given cell index. Okay, so again, these could be any dimensions, um, algorithm version, pipeline version, uh, related dimensions in the data warehouse. And when you run this query now, uh, you'll see uh, Athena will kind of do her thing. Um, and the cool thing with Athena is that you only pay for bytes scanned. So you're only paying for streaming two gigabytes of data, which is small in the S3 world, and it ran in about four seconds. And what you get back is this cross-cutting concern. You've now reorganized the hairball, and now you can look at the data along any dimension that you wanted to look at it from. And this is really digging into that manifest format and pulling out all of the facets that match without knowing the schema ahead of time and with the schema potentially even changing over time. Great. Is there, uh, I feel like we've, we've looked at the high points. Uh, are there any of the kind of 10 pointers we gave around building a self-organizing data warehouse that people uh, would like to dig into? Uh, so I, we got a question from Diego on QuickSight or SuperSight integrated with S3 for a non-technical audience. Let's see. Um, let me talk about SuperSet because that's the one we have the most experience with. Uh, so there's now a company, and we know the founders as well. Uh, they're the authors of SuperSet. So Max Boschma has Preset. It's called Preset.io, and they do hosted SuperSet for you. So that's the kind of one. If running SuperSet is a bit of a trick, um, they can kind of help with that. The biggest challenge, so first of all, I think SuperSet is a viable alternative to Tableau. I think it is a good way to look at data that's in the data warehouse. Here's the biggest hurdle you're going to hit. If you have permission silos in the data warehouse, the connection string that you hand to SuperSet is going to be totally oblivious to those silos. So uh, I think SuperSet's a perfectly valid tool for solving that problem. Um, for highly regulated environments where there's a lot of different data security silos, you're going to have trouble with SuperSet because you're going to give it a connection string to Athena or Postgres or you know, name the database. And it's going to be able to see everything, but the users who are looking at those dashboards may or may not be able to see everything. And we do, we take a slightly more localized approach uh, using Vega with Quilt, which means that like only the people who have bucket permissions can see that visualization set. But um, yeah, super set away, great tool, and a lot cheaper than Tableau. Good. Well, I, I feel like we've covered a lot. I think I hope we've given you a lot of resources for thinking about how to build more resilient data systems. Um, the real keys to a self-organizing data lake are around schema flexibility, and then being able to bail yourself out of the hairball after the fact. 
with the schema on read database. So happy to, uh, I think we'll, we'll archive this recording and um, happy to take further questions over email. But I, I want to thank everybody for attending. I, I, I had fun. <laughs> I, I hope you enjoyed it as well. And uh, yeah, if, if there are any last minute questions, we can hit those. Otherwise, we're going to wrap up. Thank you, Anish and, and Eric, uh, both uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful talk, uh, really informative. Uh, again, uh, thank you everyone for your participation today. Thank you for your questions. If you do have more questions, um, maybe longer form ones that uh, don't quite fit in a uh, very small chat window on the side, uh, feel free to email us uh, anytime. Uh, I'm ash at quiltdata.com uh, and um, I'm happy to help either answer your questions directly or escalate to Anisha or Kevin, our CEO. Uh, for those questions that uh, require further assistance. But um, thank you again. We'll have this, uh, this recording shared on our website shortly. Um, so stay tuned and uh, hope to see you all around. Great. And this is, I guess, for the benefit of the video audience. Um, can everyone see my slide here? Um, yes. Great. More. Yeah. So there you've got a couple links. And we are quiltdata.io. Don't, don't send us to .com. That will work. <laughs> but we're all, he's Ash at quiltdata.io. I'm an Ash <laughs> at quiltdata.io. No, no worries. No worries. Correct. And correct. Um, these are the principal links that we looked at. And I'll just make that big so everybody can see that. But yeah, we love to get email. We love to get questions because uh, we're kind of obsessed about making data lakes and data warehouses work better. And uh, we'll look forward to, to hearing more from you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.